As we've been slowly making our way through all of the top 10 class changes, I wanted to put out this video where we look at 50 things that you might not know about Kata. These could be the introduction of big new systems, minor changes to professions, different ways to now obtain mounts, or even UI improvements. Number one, new race and class combos. This could be anything from being a human hunter, a strutting your stuff as a dwarf shaman, keeping your raid alive now as a gnome priest, or probably my personal favourite, a Tauren paladin. You can see on this nice table here all of the additions such as dwarf mage, dwarf warlock, night elves now being able to be mages as well, blood elves being warriors, orc mages, Tauren priests, troll druids, trolls with berserking. Yes, please. Troll Warlocks and Undead Hunters, as well as all the ones that we've already spoke about. Coming in at number two is the removal of weapon skill. Ordinarily, you'd have a skills tab next to your character pane. Well, that is no more. If like me, you're a hunter using a crossbow or you're a paladin using a sword. If you get an upgrade of a weapon that you've not used before, so let's say you've never had a mace equipped, you no longer need to level it up. It is just a quality of life change, but a quality of life change which is not a bad thing for them to implement because let's be honest, how annoying is it when you've got to go and sit down in the bottom of Dalaran and just level a weapon skill mindlessly hitting a mob. Not particularly engaging, it's not particularly fun, and it's no more. In at number three is world markers. Using things like flares to show people where they're meant to be standing has been common practice up until this point. But now in Kata, you'll have these world markers that can be placed anywhere you want, making assigning where people should be stood or locations to run between in a raid just that much easier. There's very few fights where we don't use world markers and they're just a very useful tool to a raid leader's toolkit. In at number four is the improvement to interrupts. So all non-damaging interrupts which are off the global cooldown will now always hit the target so you know as well as i do on things like vezax when you've got an unholy dk put on interrupt duty and they're not spell hit capped it can be quite irritating so now things like kick mind freeze rebuke skull bash counter spell wind shear solar beam pummel and silencing shot all will always hit irrespective of whether you are hit capped or not definitely just a quality of life change but a very good one because there's certain specs in cataclysm that don't actually necessarily worry about getting hit capped coming in at number five is the new dark moon fair where you can get pets you can get mounts you can get transmog gear and it's more of just a fun place to go and hang out now. Up until this point, Dark Moon Fair's not really had a great deal that you can do there. You pretty much just head over there to get a 10% damage buff or hand in Dark Moon cards. Well, now there's tons of mini games where you can obtain tokens. You can use those tokens to buy different items and lots of achievements that are attached to it. And the achievements are pretty much all around playing the games at the Dark Moon Fair. There's also Dark Moon artifacts that can be handed in here for XP, which you'll find out in the world. And they're those sort of items that you'll just buy off the auction house just for some quick xp to skip some levels that you don't particularly like on your journey to 85 dark moon fair will definitely be one that i cover in great detail but for now all you need to know is that it changes massively coming in at number six is the mysterious egg if you've farmed oracles rep in wrath of the lich king and you grab your mysterious egg every week to wait for it to hatch and hope to get the proto drake well in cataclysm you won't have to wait quite as long because the cooldown on it actually hatching is reduced to three days not only is it reduced to three days, the chance of getting the mount is also massively increased. So if that mount's been evading you, you might be lucky enough to get it during Cataclysm. In at number seven is engineering. Now we all know engineering is an amazing profession and it doesn't change too much in Cataclysm. But one thing that does change, which will make many of us very happy, is not only can you use the Tinkers, but you can also use enchants. So where at the moment in Wrath of the Lich King, if you've got the glove enchant, which many of us have got for the haste, you lose that slot to actually put a proper enchant on. Things like the cape enchant for the parachute, where they give you agility or they give you spell power, that is no more. You still get the parachute effect if you want the parachute effect, but you could also now put an enchant on the cloak as well. Also things like nitro boosts that you have in Wrath of the Lich King have moved to the belt instead. They do have quite a high chance of fouling at level 85, but if you want that big extra speed boost, you can still do it without actually worrying about it going on your boots. It just simply goes on your belt. But the fact that you can have an enchant on your gloves as well as the tinker is absolutely amazing. In at number eight is just mastery. It's a new secondary stat added alongside crit, hit, haste, and expertise. And the benefit you gain from mastery is unique to the specialization that you're playing, such as for a resto druid, increasing your healing, 
Feral is going to increase either your bleed damage as cat or your savage defense as bear. Boomy gets bigger damage bonuses from their eclipse. Holy priests using direct healing spells put a little hot on everybody. This priests get more powerful damage and absorbs. Shadow priests have more damage done by their shadow orbs. And the list goes on, but you can sort of see the trend. Basically, you get some powerful bonus for whatever spec you play. Coming at number nine is the change to how dots and hots work. Dots and hots probably seem like a very simple thing and you can't imagine they've changed too much, but when it comes to how they're affected by haste, they've changed dramatically. Currently in Wrath of the Lich King, if you was to put a dot on a target that can be affected by haste, it will reduce the total duration of the dot. So yes, it will tick quicker, but you have to reapply it quicker at the same time. In Cataclysm, it works differently, where when you put a dot on someone, it will always have the same total duration. Instead, it will tick quicker. At certain breakpoints of haste, you will get additional ticks of your dot. The same applies to hots. So if you were to put a rejuve on someone as a resto druid, the level of haste that you have will dictate how many ticks that you'll actually get in that duration. It's quite a drastic change and it's one that I'm gonna cover in a video on its own as well. Coming in at number 10 is just a little bit of a fun one. Alchemists can now make potion of treasure finding. When you've got this on, it allows you to sometimes find extra treasure from monsters in Mount Hyjal, Vashir, Deepholm, Twilight Highlands, and Oldham. It lasts an hour and it persists through death. Basically, whenever you kill something with one of these on, you've got a chance at getting a little chest, which can contain things like volatile airs, volatile fires, extra ember silk cloth. If you're out grinding or farming or questing, it's just a really cool way that you can make some extra gold along your travels. In at number 11 is how the old reputations for the home cities has changed. In each major city, there'll now be a quartermaster which sells a tabard for their reputation. Much like the reputations in Raffaella Lich King in Northrend, while you've got one of these tabards equipped, you will gain reputation with that faction. It can be quite useful while you're leveling because at Exalted, you can get a cape that you can use and at Revered, you can get a 16 slot bag. Now the 16 slot bag's only one gold 80, so it's an extremely affordable 16 slot bag. If you ever wanted to get the achievement, the ambassador, which rewards the title, it's extremely easy to get in Cataclysm just using these tabards. Coming in at number 12 is just the fact that we're actually back in the old world now. So if 2019 Classic, if you as Alliance and your old home was Stormwind, it's now your new home again in Cataclysm. If you're Horde, of course, it'll be Ogrimmar. And the reason you're going to hang out in these places so much is because this is where the portals are to all of the new zones and obviously quick access to all of the new raids. It's also where you'll head back regularly to check the board. So if you're out lost and don't know where to go and quest, it will show you exactly where you should quest and gives you a breadcrumb quest to get there fortune cookies now if you didn't know in cataclysm inscription can make something called mysterious fortune cards it's quite simple as a scribe you either craft them or you buy them from the auction house in the effort to hopefully make more gold every time you flip one of these cards it will give you one that's got a venderable value like there i just got one that was worth five gold the thing is there is one in amongst these decks worth 5,000 gold. Using this whole pack of 20 that I just bought actually yielded pretty much nothing. But if you get lucky, you can make some pretty good gold on these. The thing that I absolutely love is you can use these in combination with food and make fortune cookies. So now with fortune cookies, every time you get a food buff, you also get a fortune card. The good thing about fortune cookies is it will always give you your most useful stat and hopefully 5k. That'd be nice. Coming in at 14 is professions and professions are now not quite as painful to level as they was before because there are some crafts that give more than one point. Using inscription as an example, you can get anywhere between three and five skill up points for each craft. This becomes a lot more common when you get to the cataclysm crafted items because many of those give at least two. But generally, the more they cost to craft, the more skill up points they give, which is really good because it means those items that you ordinarily wouldn't make, you just make the really cheap ones because it's like risk free. They've become worth crafting. In at number 15 is transmog and void storage. Void storage is somewhere where you can deposit items that you want to use for transmog, but you don't want taking up precious bag space. And then the transmogrifier is somewhere where you can use any items that you want as long as they match that slot. They do make them bound to you, so you can't just get the appearance and sell them. But you can then pay a fee to change the look of your character. That's about it. Collect items that you like the look of, keep them in your void storage until you want to use them for transmog, take them out, which does cost. There's a transfer fee, but it's all just a big gold sink to make your character look how you want it to. 
Coming in at number 16 is Tol Barad. Now, Tol Barad is basically the new Winter Grasp. It's a huge PvP battle on a timer. You can do quests and you can gain reputation. And actually, some of the trinkets are very, very strong. So doing this reputation farm by doing the quests and doing as many Tol Barads as you can whenever they're available is definitely going to be something that a lot of people are doing. The tank trinket in particular is one that everyone raves about because it's useful throughout the entire expansion. Tol Barad also is the home of Barad in Hold, which is basically the new Vault of Archivon, where with each tier of content, a new boss is introduced, and that boss will drop current PvP gear and current tier gear. In at number 17, keeping along the PvP lines, is two new battlegrounds, Twin Peaks and Battle for Gilneas. Twin Peaks is basically just a reskin of Warsong Gulch, where there's a base at either end and a flag in that base. You need to keep your flag where it is, whilst going and getting their flag and bringing it back to your base. Battle for Gilneas is a bit like a Raffi Basin. There's three areas that need to be captured and held, and the more of them you have, the more points you're going to get. Coming in at 18 is the Dwarf Racial Stone Form. Stone Form's been changed now. It still removes all poison, disease, and bleed effects, but it also reduces all damage taken by 10%. So this can actually be used as a really solid personal defensive cooldown if you happen to have something like a Dwarf Paladin. A 10% damage reduction cooldown as a tank pretty good. Coming in at number 19 is Druid specific, but it is actually racial related. Druids can now use Shadow Meld if you're a Night Elf, or War Stomp if you're a Tauren, so they can be used while shapeshifted. Not a ridiculously huge change, but definitely for any Druids out there, being able to have the AoE stun from War Stomp and it not take you out of bear while you're tanking, for example, super strong. Coming in at number 20 is kind of an obvious one. There's two new races in Cataclysm. You have the Goblins and you have the Wargons. Wargons have a mini sprint that they can use, their critical strike chance is increased, and their skin in skill and speed is increased. Goblins have a rocket jump that they can use to jump forward as well as launch rockets at enemies. They receive vendor discounts, they can periodically summon a personal bank, their haste is increased by 1% and their alchemy skill and potion healing is increased. Both of these races have really cool starting zones that you're no doubt going to want to experience at some point during your Cataclysm journey. Coming in at number 21, there's a new underwater zone, first that we've ever seen. We know there's been small areas that you have to do quests in underwater, such as the one in Arafi Highlands, but this is a full underwater questing zone. There's also a rare down there called Poseidus that can be found, and he drops an epic seahorse that can be sold on the auction house, which a lot of people are going to want to get hold of. Overall, it's a super interesting if not slightly frustrating, zone to level him. Coming in at 22 is the addition of Guild Finder. It's quite simple. You just pick exactly what sort of things you want to do, whether you can tank, heal, or DPS. Put a comment in there, maybe with your availability in a bit more detail than just weekdays and weekends, and then you can browse guilds. Ordinarily, in here, there would be lots and lots of listings of different guilds explaining what their goal of the game is and what they're possibly recruiting as well. You can then simply select one of them and request membership, and hopefully you get invited. But it's a really easy way to find a guild and a really good way to advertise your guild as well. In at number 23 is one you've no doubt heard about, which is Reforging. Reforging is just a great way to customize your gear further. So for me, for example, I want lots of haste. So you can take any item that you're using and you can reforge any of the secondary stats, in this case, mastery, for 40% of that as any other secondary stat that you want. So in this case, haste. It costs gold every time you do it, and you can actually restore it back to its original for free. But it'll be a great way to be able to hit those break points on your character or hit hit caps and expertise caps, so most items will be usable. Coming in at 24 is archaeology, which is a new secondary profession. You can use this profession to make gold. You can use this profession to get pets, mounts, and even bind on account items. It's quite a long grind, so it's definitely not something you're going to want to do on lots of characters, but everyone's going to at least want it on their main so they can get these really super powerful 359 bind on account items. Coming in at number 25, Wailing Caverns has been made smaller to make it much faster and less frustrating to clear. Not really much to say here, but the entire maze of Wailing Caverns has been stripped out. So when you're queuing for random dungeon finder and you get Wailing Caverns and the group falls apart because nobody can be bothered sitting in there for three hours, three hours might be a bit of an exaggeration, but no more. It's a lot shorter, a lot quicker to get through. Another bonus one that I'll throw in while we're talking about dungeons, Stratholm as well, no longer requires keys to open the post boxes. So if you want to spawn the postmaster, you just need to click on free post boxes now. Nothing massively interesting, but thought I'd throw it in there. If you like getting achievements, then you're going to love number 26, because coming in at 26 is guild achievements. Some of these guild achievements have very, very cool rewards, which we're going to look at in the next couple of points. But basically, there's lots of different things that you can strive towards as a guild and get rewards for it. It doesn't matter whether you're a PvP guild, guild or a pve guild some of these you're just going to want to work on 
So if you've been a guild throughout all of Classic so far, and you've been collecting the legendaries and actually keeping those players in the guild with them, you might be able to get We Are Legendary this expansion. If not, it's actually reason to go back and get some of these things. Overall, guild achievements are just a great way to bring your guild together and work towards common goals. Coming in at number 27 is extra heirlooms. Now these heirlooms actually come directly from guild achievements or the guild leveling system. In your guild panel, you'll be able to see what level your guild is and you have a daily cap that you'll work towards just by simply doing quests or dungeons or even completing weekly guild challenges, which don't only reward guild experience, but they also deposit gold straight into your guild bank. For example, if you want to get the heirloom helmets, you need to reach guild level 20. Guild level 10 will unlock the capes, and working as a team gives the heirloom legs. Coming in at 28 while still staying along the lines of guild achievements is Mixmaster. You can get a recipe for Cauldron of Battle. To get Cauldron of Battle, you need to craft a thousand flasks in your guild. Once you've done that, you can actually get Big Cauldron of Battle, which will require 3,000 flasks to be crafted. Making cauldrons will always be more cost effective than everybody bringing their own flask, but it enables you to put a cauldron down in a raid, everyone can click on it, get some flasks out of it, and they're sorted for the raid. You get 30 cauldron uses out of the big cauldron of battle, and these are affected by guild level perks such as Chuggalug, which will double the duration of flasks used from cauldrons, as well as increasing the number of flasks gained from using a guild cauldron by 50%. So it's just a super efficient and cost effective way of making sure everyone in your raid has got flasks. Coming in at number 29 is Vengeance, and this is what gets tanks absolutely pumping in Cataclysm. Because each time you take damage while in bear form as a druid, you gain 5% of the damage taken as attack power up to a maximum of 10% of your health. This alone is part of the reason why threat becomes less of an issue in Cataclysm because you've got so much attack power as tanks that you're doing as much damage as DPS or more than DPS in some cases. It's also why exclusively stacking stamina for most tanks is the way to go, because the more health you're going to have, the more attack power you're going to get. Coming in at number 30 is the new fishing and cooking dailies in major cities. Not only do you get skill points in both fishing and cooking for completing the quests, reputation with the faction of the city that you're actually doing the quest from, and of course a bag as a reward that might have a pet in, or a weather-beaten fishing hat, or even a jeweled fishing pole. If you're after achievements, you will need to get all of the dailies done in each of the cities for your faction. Not not the other faction, that would be weird. Coming in at 31 is Rated Battlegrounds. So now you can really put your PvP prowess to the test. Rated Battlegrounds require a full group, and you will of course take on another full group, and you'll get Conquest Points. Conquest Points are of course earned by doing Arena as well, but Rated Battlegrounds do give more than just Conquest Points. You can gain a rating in Rated Battlegrounds to get the old school titles again. If you remember farming AV constantly in 2019 trying to get Grand Marshal, well, you can get Grand Marshal again now by earning a rating of 2.4k in Rated Battlegrounds. In at number 32 is how you can now obtain the Winter Spring Frost Saber if you're Alliance. Up until this point, you've needed to rep farm to Exalted to be able to get the mount. Well, no more. There's actually a quest called They Grow Up So Fast, where it's a daily quest that just takes 20 days to complete, assuming you're doing it every day, and then you can get the mount. Coming in at number 33 is actually a change that happened during Cataclysm. But assuming we're going to go in on a final patch state, I think it's something that's important that you understand. If you was thinking it was a good idea to go goblin to be able to make Viola de Sands or even the engineering helicopters, you're probably thinking of doing it so you can use the racial best deals anywhere to then get the vendorable mats that you need a lot cheaper. Well, don't, because you only get the discount on faction-specific vendors. Back in the day, people would have a goblin that they'd buy these things on to be able to then make the mounts cheaper than anybody else so they get a higher profit margin. You can't do that anymore. Coming in at number 34, have you ever been really annoyed that you're in the middle of the water and you can't mount up well don't be because as long as you're at the surface of the water you can now mount any flying mount to get out that was a nice quick one in at number 35 the auction house there's actually now an auction house that doesn't require engineering in dalaran and also in shatraf it's a minor quality of life change but if you're leveling through outland and northrend just a nice little change Number 36 is Lifeblood. Lifeblood up until this point has just been a small hot that you can put on yourself if you're a herbalist. Well, now it actually gives haste as well. So it's an incredibly powerful cooldown for anyone who can make good use of haste on their character. Not really a lot else to say. Number 37, we are going to get two new legendaries. Well, technically three, but one of them's a set. When Firelands launches, casters are going to be able to get Dragon Wrath, Taragosa's Rest, which has obviously incredible stats because you would expect it to, but the really unique things about this weapon is not only does it have a proc on it that when you deal damage, you have a chance to gain the Wrath of Taragosa duplicate in the harmful spell, you can also use it as your mount. 
You can use it to transform into Taragosa's Visage, allowing you to fly very fast. Rogues are going to be extremely happy with the daggers that they can get during Dragon Soul, where you get the Fangs of the Father. Your main hand equip increases the damage dealt by Sinister Strike and Revealing Strike by 45%. And you also get a nice use effect on there, which slows your falling speed for 15 seconds on a 5 minute cooldown. So you got your very own parachute built into your daggers. The set bonus for using these are incredible, where your melee attacks have a chance to grant Shadows of the Destroyer, increasing your agility by 17, stacking up to 50 times, which is crazy. And each application past 30 grants an increasing chance to trigger Fury of the Destroyer. When triggered, it consumes all applications of Shadows of the Destroyer, immediately granting five combo points and causes your finishing moves to generate five combo points. And that lasts six seconds. Just super, super powerful. In at 38 is just an interesting one for the healers. In Wrath of the Lich King at the moment, when you heal with a critical strike, it does one and a half times that heal. In Kata, it goes up to two times. So a critical heal is literally just double. As you can quite clearly see here, somewhere between nine and a half to 10k my normal heals and then straight to 20k for a crit heal. The number 39 CCs have changed. So when you CC a mob now with something like an Ice Trap or a Polymorph or a Sap, if they're not in combat, it won't pull everything around them. So setting up CCs in dungeons and raids on targets before the tank pulls is so much cleaner now. Ordinarily in Wrath, when you CC a target, everything around it will now get in combat and run straight towards you. You can use this quite cleverly to skip trash in some circumstances because if you CC everything, none of it's going to be in combat and you can just try and make a nice wide berth around it. But overall, the purpose of it is to get up good CCs on targets before you pull the remaining trash. In at number 40 is the new glyph system. You now get three new glyph slots, which are called prime glyph slots. You still have your three majors and you have your three minors but the prime glyphs are the ones that make the biggest difference to your rotation or to your abilities also you no longer lose the glyphs when you use them instead your glyph system is like a collection pane so once you've learned the glyphs you'll have them forever instead what you'll need is a dust of disappearance which you'll use to switch between one glyph and another coming in at number 41 could be quite a useful one to know before we actually get to the cat pre-patch because the emblem system changes to a point system so at the moment where you gain emblems you will gain points instead but the good thing that you need to know here is when the pre-patch hits and this goes live any emblems of heroism valor conquest or even badges of justice you have will be transferred into gold so for every one of the Heroism, Valor and Conquest, you're going to get five and a half gold. And for Badges of Justice, which are from TBC, you're going to get just over 1.8 gold. But a good thing to know here is if you're stacked up on loads and loads of emblems of, let's say, Frost, as we get closer to the Cataclysm pre-patch, you can trade them all down to Conquest and cash in on loads of gold. Any emblems of Frost that you've got at the end of Wrath of the Lich King will be transferred into the new system, which is Justice Points. In at number 42 is good old Zolgarab and Zola Man. Now, you'll probably remember these from original classic in 2019, where we had Zolgarab, and then in TBC, where we had Zola Man, where they've actually been remade into very challenging five-man heroics. You won't see these until the second phase of content, more than likely, because they drop free 5 free gear, which is nearly as good as normal raid gear, and they're really there for catch-up. But they are incredibly well-tuned, really difficult five-man heroics, and they almost feel like mini raids but in a five-man format all of the fights are uniquely different from their original format in fact only a few of the mechanics are even recognizable number 43 is a nice quick one keys are removed you no longer have a keychain at all and any keys that you do have when it goes over into cataclysm will simply become trash that you can vendor this actually leads us nicely on to change 44 because as a byproduct of keys being removed you can now do heroic TBC dungeons with no reputation requirement. The same will apply to Karazhan. The attunement quests still exist, but the key is no longer required to open the door, even though we know there's a little gap around the side where you get him without the key anyway. But if you need heroic TBC dungeons for achievements or anything like that, but you can't be bothered to go back and farm the rep to be able to get into them, when Kata pre-patch hits and all the keys are removed, you won't need to. In at number 45 is a really simple one. Gems in your bags now stack. If you carry around lots of gems with you, ready to stick them in your new gear because you can't wait to get back to an auction house, they now stack. So they take up less bag space. Not really a lot to say. 
For number 46, it really is just the improved quest flow for all zones. This does include Outland and Northrend. Now, we know that they're obviously made quicker by reducing the XP requirements between level 1 and 80, but the way you quest in these zones have took on a much more modern approach. There's no more jumping between zone to zone until you run out of quests at your level and then you need to go back there 10 levels later to finish them off. Instead, you simply go to the board in your major city, see where it's sending you and go there and just quest away. They work like small hubs like they do in Northrend. You'll get a few quests, you go out, hand them in, you go back. It's a lot more of a linear experience. Definitely something that I prefer. I like to just go to a zone and stay there until it's done. You can do that now. Even though Northrend didn't need many adjustments, it did see some just to make that even more linear than it already was. In at number 47 is buffs and debuffs and the homogenization across these buffs and debuffs. Many of these buffs could only be brought by one person. Using Bloodlust as the best example, up until this point, if you haven't got shamans, you can't have Bloodlust or Heroism. Well, now it's been added in the form of Time Warp to Mages and even Beastmasters with a Corehound pet can bring Ancient Hysteria. Things like the 5% crit chance for your raid where you've relied on Feral Druids and Fury Warriors to bring it, now Elemental Shamans bring it, Sub Rogues and even Hunter's Pets. A lot of these buffs and debuffs can be brought by a lot wider range of specs now, and this is primarily to do with the fact that you can do 10-man raids, and it would be quite harsh if you was forced to take the exact same 10 people or 10 specs to try and get as many of these buffs as possible. It's due to 10 mans that this has brought in a bit more flexibility. And it also has turned the Hunter into a literal Swiss army knife of buffs and debuffs. In at number 48 is the Dungeon Journal, which I personally absolutely love. We know we've got add-ons that do similar things like Atlas Loot, where you can look through what loot drops from each boss. But with the Dungeon Journal, it gives you an idea of what the raid mechanics are for the boss, which ones you need to look out for, which abilities are interruptible, what the differences are between normal and heroic tactics, and of course what loot drops from each boss as well. The good thing is you could even filter by class, so you could say, well, I want to know what health has dropped for a mage, and it will just show you those items. I feel that for a newer player, this is a great way just to have a look at a raid boss and get a rough idea of what's going on. Coming in at 49 is there's no more ammo slot. So if you're a hunter, a warrior with a gun, or even a rogue with a bow, you no longer need ammo. It's not that there's just not a slot. It doesn't take space up in your bag because ammo is infinite. We're all just firing magic arrows and magic bullets now. Just a real quick quality of life change, which I personally, as someone who plays a hunter a lot, really like. And finally, we touched on the fact already that Valor Points and Justice Points replace the Emblem system, but how do you get them? My favourite change when it comes to the Valor Points system is the fact that you have a weekly cap of 1250 that you can acquire, but when you use Random Dungeon Finder, you're not limited to only being able to get this once a week. You're actually limited to getting it seven times a week. So in Wrath, where you do your daily heroic to get the bonus emblems, if you miss that day, you miss those emblems. In Cataclysm, it doesn't matter. If you miss that day, you just know you can make that up in the days to come. As long as you get all seven of your heroics done over the space of that week, you won't miss any Valor Points. This just alleviates the need to log on every single day to make sure you don't miss that heroic, and you can just make it up. You can have a day off and the next day do two or do three, so you know it takes the pressure off of getting them all done for the rest of the week. If you're doing raids, you're probably going to cap fairly quick anyway. And because you have that Valor cap, it does take the pressure off from having to do heroics every day anyway, because you might just get Valor cap from raiding. But there are 50 changes about Cataclysm that you might not know. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like and subscribe. Follow me over on Kick. Consider joining the channel as a member if you enjoy these videos, just to show that extra bit of support. And I'll see you on the next one.